I'd like to welcome everybody to this January 5th workshop meeting of the Newman Board of Aldermen. At this time, would you join me in a prayer? Heavenly Father, we just ask you to be with us and continue to offer to us your blessings. And, and while you're in our presence, that we would do those things that would be pleasing to you and would be in the best interest of our city. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our country? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Of America. Of the you call the roll? Alderman Bingle? Here. Alderman Harris? Present. Alderman Astor? Here. Mayor Outlaw? Here. Alderman Kinsey? Here. Alderman Best? Present. Alderman Adam? Here. Okay, everybody good? Anything before we get going? I do. Um, Mayor, if you just allow me for a minute to sidestep um, this, this meeting to just pay respects to one of New Bern's most notable citizens, and that's Mr. Lonnie Pridgen. His funeral is taking place during this meeting, so therefore I, I could not be in attendance, but I just want to, you know, uh, offer my deepest sympathy um, to his family and to the citizens. Um, he was a well-known and well-respected member of this community. New Bern is a better place. Uh, and the growth that we, we saw really was the result of the work that he did along with Tommy Karam, who was, of course, also deceased. But I just want to pay respects. He's a former county commissioner, just a you know an all-around great citizen of this city. And I did want to pay respects to him and his family at this time. Anything else? Thank you. Okay, Mr. Stevens, let's go ahead and uh, turn this over to you and get us going. Okay, thank you, Mayor, um, and Happy New Year to, to the board um, and citizens out there. Um, today uh, we have uh, a work session, um, as was called for, uh, back in December at our meeting uh, to discuss um, elections uh, and other charter topics uh, that require uh, North Carolina legislature approval. Uh, oftentimes, uh, when uh, changes come about uh, and discussed, uh, we, we have uh, generally tried to get those on the long session. This, this is upcoming uh, currently, and we want to try to get that in as quickly as we can so that we can get that up to uh, the folks in Raleigh uh, to begin their work uh, to get this uh, passed potentially with uh, North Carolina legislature. So um, there are several things that we cover in our charter. One of them is elections, and the board has mentioned this several times. And at the request of Alderman Bingle, uh, we're going to, uh, we had this on the agenda today. And then there are a couple other items, if we have time, we can get to, uh, and if the board wishes to continue this meeting, they can do so. Um, and uh, we will, we will uh, work at the pleasure of the board at this time. So um, without holding anything else up, um, the elections uh, process, obviously, you know, we are on a four year cycle, uh, all uh, seven seats come up for election uh, every four years. They are on the odd years. Uh, so next year, uh, 2021, uh, well, I guess this year actually now, 2021 is your uh, typical cycle for election. Um, in doing so, this also kind of uh, puts us in a bind a little bit, if you want to call it that, because of the latest census data that was taken for the 2020 census and the likelihood that that data will not be complete and ready for us to do any kind of redistricting and things like that. That's hence the reason why, one of the reasons why we uh, are here to discussing today. So there's several different things that we look at during elections. You're looking at um, what is your cycle, whether you want to remain where you are on the odd years. There's additional costs to being on the odd years. We have Ms. Ray with uh, our, our uh, uh, board of elections here today. And um, she's here to answer any kind of detailed questions. But ultimately, there's costs associated with us having our own uh, off um, primary, I'm, I'm sorry, not off primary, but off legislative and federal years. Uh, so we have uh, shared that cost typically with River Bend and Trent Woods, a couple other municipalities. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, I know Trent Woods has already petitioned to kind of move to uh, the even year. Uh, I know uh, Mr. Jackson's here from the town of River Bend, the city ma town manager there. He's here to, to see how this goes, and Miss uh, and Miss Ray is uh, here. He wants to hear her. So I think uh, River Bend is also interested in potentially moving to the even years. Um, so today, there's the, of the things that we're going to discuss and look at. If the board wishes to choose to move to the even years, 
what is the potential cost associated or cost savings associated with doing so or staying where you are. Then you have to decide if the board wishes to continue the, uh, to, to continue to have runoffs or do you want the plurality method. Uh, then you have also a decision to make of whether you want to do, to get on the cycle of the even years, a one year or a five year term to get on the uh, non-presidential even year. So it's kind of where we are currently. Um, what I would like to do is turn this over to Alice right now because I know there's going to be some questions surrounding the census data, surrounding the redistricting that may come about uh, following uh, this 2020 census. So I want to give her some background to educate this board about that process and how that goes about. And then ultimately um, uh, we, can, we can go from there and answer, she can answer any kind of questions. And then at that point uh, we can have Melanie come up uh, and she can discuss some of the uh, details regarding some of the costs associated with um, um, the election process. So Alice, if you, if you don't mind. And I know, uh, Ms. Ray, you have a meeting prior or after this. Is that correct? Yeah, if you have to get 12 for okay. Just kind of general information. I'm going to go through the first couple of slides pretty fast because it's just general information. But really, before I start, um, I did receive an email probably about 30 minutes or so again from uh, Bob Coates, who's the state liaison with the census. And he is indicating that the general, general, the end of the year, so December the 1st, should I take my mask off? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so December the 31st, the the, the president should have already gotten the census data. There was a, because of the COVID virus, there was delays in how that census was collected. So Bob's email indicated that it's probably looking like the end of January before that is taken to the, to the president. And then so from there, that gets, pushes back the data that we would get for redistricting. And we probably are looking, um, Usually we get it April, the first of April, but we're probably looking like June or July from my last understanding. So just kind of just, like I said, I'm gonna go through this pretty fast. Um, so we are located in the section five of the Voting Rights Act. Um, there's 40 counties in the state that are a part of that, Craven County being one of them. And what that generally means is we have to get preclearance on any kind of changes that we make to the um, voting information or boundaries or locations. Um, so kind of the history of New Bern districts or wards, um, 1957, the city was divided into five wards. Uh, 1985, the city was further divided into six wards. Um, and then there was uh, ordinances that were adopted that says from those six wards that um, wards can be changed provide and as needed. Um, so why would we need to, um, why do we redistrict uh, again as soon as, uh, as Mark said, uh, as soon as a new federal census is indicated, we need to look at whether or not there's an imbalance in those wards. So there's two kinds of districts in the, in the North Carolina statutes. One is a residency district. If you, if you reside in that, you can vote for anyone. So there's no, never a need to redistrict. But we have the true electoral district or ward, which means that you, the, the candidates have to reside in that district and the people that live in that district or ward have to vote for that, just that candidate. So do we have to redistrict? Uh, again, we don't know until we get the, the numbers, but we, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but the Equal Protection Clause says, you know, one vote for one person. Um, and there's kind of a general rule, a 10% rule to look at to kind of judge whether or not you need to redistrict. And how you kind of test that rule is you take the number of populations when we finally get it, divide it by six, the six wards, and get that ideal population for each ward. Then you look at the most populous ward and see what's the difference between that ideal population and their actual population. Is that greater than 10%? And 
and then you look at the least populous ward and do the same thing, and then you add those two together, and if they add up to 10% or greater, then you, you need to. So in 2010, we were actually at 42%, so that's how in balance we were. Um, so kind of the processes, um, I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of these, you can, other than to say pretty fast. We do have to get preclearance, um, and so the process, we have to get the preclearance and then new districts are determined. They're sent to the, uh, the city attorney. will send that information to the Department of Justice. Usually it takes about 60 days for the process at a minimum. Um, then we will go back in the ordinance and you're required to generally use the same kind of ordinance or resolution. Last time we used a resolution, so we'll, we'll need to stick with that. Then we'll have maps and other information provided to the public. We'll provide that same information to the Board of Elections so that they can make change and notify the voters. Alice, sorry, uh, don't sure. want to interrupt you. Can you step just a little bit closer to the mic? Apparently some people um, on the phone call can't hear real well, so. I'm sorry. They can't hear you. Is that better? All right, so kind of looking, oh yeah, gosh. Here. <laughs> looking at the demographic shifts, um, I just, uh, just recently, July, um, estimates for population were pro provided. Um, you can kind of see the numbers we are as a city um, changing demographically. Um, I, I, I will say that I don't agree with the S population estimates. We have, um, and we'll, we'll see some of those numbers, um, built over 2,000 structures since the last census, and for us to only be 500 people ahead doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I have a sneaky feeling we will be um, making some challenges, or hopefully we've got good counts and we won't have to. So just kind of look at how we did in 2010 on the left-hand side of the, the map there. That's what the ward looked like in 2010. Um, and then on the right in March of 2012, the actual adopted uh, wards were adjusted. So you can see how they changed. So things to consider, um, don't try and make all the wards equal in population because they don't grow um, equally. Um, but do, we do have to stay under the 10% deviation rule. Um, we want to make our boundaries easy to follow and distinguish so you know what, who, who's in what ward, um, easily to accessible and no retrogression. Alice, can I ask a question? Sure. My notes, I had pulled my notes from when we did it in 2010, 12. And we had plus or minus 5%. Is 10% a new, a new thing? But I was looking that it said, you know, our numbers were plus or minus five. We, we determined that 5,000 was the number. At that point, it was 30,000, and that each ward would be plus or minus 5%. <coughs> Has something changed, or? Um, generally, the 10% rule is what I've always been told, and that's what the School of Government indicated to us. Um, I will say that I'm scheduled to take a class December the 1st, I mean, the 21st, with the School of Government on seeing if there's any changes okay. for local government, so I, I can but, pass that along with you. But look at my, no, look to the notes, showing it was plus or minus five, that's why when I saw this, I wasn't sure about the 10%. Well, I will say that when we did it, when we took the low, the high, most populous ward and the most low, the lowest, least populous ward, we were at like 42%, so we were well, well above, I, I yeah, so. Um, so we can kind of look, um, Again, on the left-hand side, that's the census before we made any changes, and then with the, the new boundaries, you can see that they're not exactly, um, what is it, 49-21, and we know those areas have um, grown differently than ward, ward 1 and Ward 3, for example, changes significantly different. And we'll take a look at that. So kind of, a, we looked at uh, growth since 2012, um, and I know that table is kind of small. I can send a uh, copy of this to you. But you can see that, especially Ward 1, um, there's very small growth as far as new population or new development, where Ward 3 and Ward 4, for example, have grown significantly. If you look at um, just the building permits alone, uh, major areas where we've seen a significant amount of uh, new growth or new homes or new development, Ward one is not even in the, the list there. You can see ward in the, the orange and uh, red dots indicate where we've had new building permits for new housing units. So just 
Visually looking at it, you can see significantly that Ward 3 has grown significantly. Ward 4 has grown significantly as far as new housing development and Ward 6 as well. So I've just taken, just looking at housing units and based on my notes from the last development or the last redistricting, um, just as just a look at it, um, we could we had planned anyway that hopefully Township Seven would be one ward all to itself. In other words, that would probably all be Ward um, Three. We probably just looking at the housing units because I don't have the population data to work with yet. We might also have to include the Township Two into that. So if you look on the left hand side, that's our current ward boundaries, and on the right, this is just a general first look at it based on just housing units and new development. There's also some little pockets that we tried to clean up from the first, uh, just to try to get some numbers. We added some little pockets of uh, neighborhoods. We kind of split some neighborhoods. And like I said, we want to try to have them easily defined so that any citizen knows exactly what ward they're in. So look at possible adjustments again. Um, total potential housing units, um, you can see Ward 1 is significantly different than Ward 3 and, and other information. So on the right hand side you can see just, this is just looking at housing units. Um, we want to have roughly 2,800 or so and there's significantly differences or imbalances in those wards. So thinking really, just looking at it, you know, we really did a pretty good job in 2012 looking ahead and I, I don't think there's going to be significantly um, changes other than taking uh, Ward 3 all into Township 2 and, sev 2 and 7 and removing that, that area that is currently Ward 3 into splitting that between Ward 2 and Ward 1. So the 2020 census data, um, again, we've already, I've already kind of mentioned this, by law or by statute, it's supposed to be there December the 3rd, 31st, it's already missed that deadline. Um, according to Bob Coates, we're probably looking at it late January. And then the data that we will get for um, data summary files for redistricting, we probably are talking likely June or July before we can, and then we have like a 90 day process where we can go and make challenges that, you know, we don't agree with the count or, or what have you. So we'll have that little pocket. So we're probably talking late fall or whatever before we actually have numbers that we can start the redistricting process. And I think um, go, going back to that slide real quickly, uh, just as far as the timing uh, standpoint, you know, that really pushes us if there's a 90 day uh, you know, period for us to make for, uh, comments or responses or, or challenges. Uh, additionally, our stuff has to be approved by um, by court system. Right? We have to go. We have to do a preclearance, so we have to send it to the Department of Justice. Yeah, so we have to go through different process to have it approved. <laughs> and most likely, Melanie, and I'm not going to speak for you, but I, I'm pretty sure June is typically when, it, at the latest, you'd like to see stuff to get it on election ballots for November. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the likelihood that we're going to be anywhere close to having redistricting information for this year's election is, is highly unlikely, 0% most likely. So um, uh, just wanted to kind of add that to that just so we understand all the different timelines at play here. Yeah, so we, in 2010, 2011, we got the data around April. Actually, I think we got it in March, and it was March of the following year before we actually completed the whole process. And adopted the, the new war boundaries. Of course, they were significantly a lot more changes. There was, we were we were really out of balance in a lot of wars. So I don't, I'm hoping this time it won't won't be such a, a big adjustment. Any questions for Alice? And, um, and again, all of the changes that you see on the map that's just preliminary. She was just doing some best guesses based on housing units. Uh, obviously, there's lots of other factors that take into account where those will end up, but uh, that kind of gives you a, a breakdown of just some forethought that goes into uh, the districting boundaries. And there's a, a link on yeah. the map there that I, I made public for you guys to 
um, or anyone who wants to look at the, the data where we have residential structures, where we've had new new housing units and stuff like that. So you can kind of. If Alice, you want do you to. have any information on hypothetically if we had if the census had been done October of 2018, a month after the hurricane? Do you have any any idea of the outward migration per se of of populations? Uh, to other areas because of the hurricane, and has this or can this be taken to, to consideration? In other words, I'm sure another two more years of recovery, uh, the population is going to trend back toward New Bern that folks that are either living out of town. I mean, some folks have moved to Greenville and other areas uh, temporarily. And it, was that taken into consideration? Yeah, I mean, we've so I'm on the I'm the lo I'm actually the chair of the local government committee for the state GIS, and so I'm in communications with Bob Coates, who's a, again the state liaison to the census, as well as Mike Klein, who's a state demographer, and that that has been a, a big concern that I have been pushing that you know we have people that have a, a property. Let's give the Woodrow area because they, there were quite a few properties that were um, damaged there um, that might still want to reside there or might be residing there that are living wherever somewhere else or living with family members or what have you so we've been pushing on that and that information um, I know Bob Coates has uh, told local governments to, to utilize their GIS data as far as like building permits and stuff like that um, relocation service accounts to have the good documentation so that when the counts come in we can challenge them we have challenged estimates before we challenged in 2000 when I first started here um, the original counts, and we actually lost more people. So that's not a good thing. But uh, so we do have great documentation that from the last census that we've been keeping in our GIS that we can provide great support. Um, we challenged the state estimates as well, and we've won several challenges for that because we have great documentation to show. Uh, like I said, we've had since the the um, you know, 2012, we've had over 2,000 housing units that have been constructed, and it doesn't make sense that we've only gained 500 people. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, do you have any recommendations for the council, what we should do, uh, anything that we should uh, request um, to mitigate right. this situation? Um, I think uh, I Mike Klein, this, I'm sorry. Go ahead, all the woman this is Alderwoman Harris. It's, it's very hard to hear um, what's being said, but I'm not sure. Was, was Mark saying that this information won't be back in time for the election? So is this something that the new board is going to be voting on, or is it something that will be handled and voted at the end of the year? Um, what, what I was saying, uh, Alderman Woman Harris, is that uh, based on the timeline, and if you'll go back to it real quickly, um, uh, Alice, to that page that's at the end of your, uh, right before the questions, uh, essentially the timing, from the timing standpoint, we're not anticipating getting the results from the federal government of the 2020 census until at least May, if not June or July. Uh, Ms. Ray, with the elections uh, uh, of Craven County, they, they um, typically want to have the ballots uh, and information for the ballots ready to go by no later than June, July-ish. Um, if we get those maps or that census data back by um, June, July, we're not going to have time to challenge or have any kind of discussion regarding the district boundaries or any of that stuff prior to needing to set forth the information to Ms. Ray for the ballot for the upcoming October, November elections. I so, don't, I don't so think that was her question. I think her question was, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alderman Harris, I believe her question was, would this board, would this current board, before we leave office, not for the election, would we determine those wards Prior to, so is it possible that by the end of 2021 we would have determined what the new wards or what well, the new I think, boundaries look like? I think like? a lot of that has to do with the board because as, as, as Alice stated the um, in the previous uh, redistricting that we did back in 2012, 2012, 2012, it took us a year to complete that. 
Um, now, granted, she, uh, as Alice presented here in this, this uh, presentation, there's not a tremendous amount of changes, but sometimes those can be very political when discussions have to be made by the boards. Then it has to be, you know, we have to go through the challenge, then we have to go through getting it approved, which we're in COVID, so who knows what uh, kind of timeline we will have with the Department of Justice regarding that as far as their review. So honestly, your guess is as bad as mine. Okay. Well, my bad, my bad guess is about 2022 to 2023 with COVID myself. That, that, that um, information to us, I'm definitely in favor of um, allowing the, the next board to determine if that's something that could be done. I just wanted to put that out there. Um, I have a, I wanted to say, make a statement as well. Yes, this is all the best. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. Based on the based, based on the information that I just heard, I mean, it seems like it's gonna be a time crunch for getting this data. So I, I concur with all the parents of letting this be decided by the next incoming board. That's fine. I say we get it when we get it. I mean, I don't think we are pushing one way or the other. I don't feel like I'm pushing one way or the other to get the information. I say it follows its natural course when we get, you know, we don't know that June or July we're going to get it either based on what's happening. So when we get it, we get it. We work towards it. If we're the board that can decide it, then we're the board. If not, it moves to the next board. I, I, you know, I don't think we can hush it, you know, rush it up or determine we have to have it by this date. I think it's just the information, and I would support the fact that it would move on to the next governing board if it's not prepared by the time we leave office. I have no issue with that. You're still going to have an election. I mean, yeah, we're still going to have an election regardless. It doesn't make any difference, you know. Correct. Alice, a question on your one of your slides for kinds of districts. Um, the true electoral district, which is what we have, means you have to live in the district or the ward and only those residents or citizens in that district and ward vote for that individual. Correct. The, the one above that says residency districts, um, says the candidate must live in the ward, but the whole city would vote. Is, is that almost like an at-large, except there's a, re a re residency requirement? Is that what that means? Right, correct. And so, they, so you can vote for any at-large uh, candidate. So you, there are no... Um, requirements as far as residency, what ward you live in, where we're on the true electoral district where we have a requirement for them to reside. So, so is the reason the statement that's there says no need to redistrict because anyone can vote, does that mean that the redistricting and all the rules that go along with that is to make it equal and fair for the voters? That's the reason for that? Generally, yes. Okay, thank you. You can, you can almost relate the true electoral district to the six aldermen and the residential or the residency district to the mayor. Essentially, he serves at large, like you mentioned, and at large, some municipalities will have four, like if it, if it was a makeup of this board, some boards will be a mayor who is voted on by the entire city population. They'll have like maybe two at larges that are voted by the entire population, and then they'll have four, bound, four uh, 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 ward boundaries. So they'd have four, four aldermen, two at-large aldermen, and a mayor. Some of them do that. All right. Alice, thank you. Um, at this time, uh, we'll ask Ms. Ray to come up. I think she's got some information with regards to some of the uh, cost uh, difference between the two different election options or well I guess there's about five or six different election options depending on what the board chooses but ultimately uh, looking at if you stay where you are if you do plurality or not and if you move to the new uh, election cycle which would be the even years uh, what some of those costs will be and what some of the timing will be so at this point I turn it over to Ms. Ray. Basically the presentation that you have is the one that I did early 2019. It's not changed much. Um, if anything, your costs have gone down because we've um, combined some precincts and things like that. We've changed some things. But 
Um, as far as basically the gist of it, if you move from the um, nonpartisan election runoff method, which is October, and then if you have a runoff, you go to November. If you go to November only, you will be sharing cost, and you will be having a savings of, let me get to that page, roughly around, um, if you just went to an October and had no runoff at all, um, you would have um, a savings of about $16,000 to $17,000. If you had October and then a runoff, normally you usually have two races in a runoff, usually and historically. If you went to um, a savings there, you would be saving about $36,000 if you went to one election. So basically, it's, it's a big cost savings. Uh, because you will have shared expenses with all the municipalities that are running. The only one that would be a little bit expensive is your early voting, your absentee by mail, and your early voting. Currently, only Riverbend, Havelock, and you allow absentee voting. So those costs would only be split three ways going forward. But, and then if you went to even years, it goes way down. The only thing you would be responsible for is the programming for the names of the candidates to go on the ballots and your ballot expense. So it would drop down to probably around $5,500 for the election. So you're looking at you know, big cost savings going to even years. I did um, try to research quickly this morning since I got the phone call yesterday to be present today. There are currently about 29 municipalities that are in even years currently. And they, a lot of them are staggered. So some are in off years, mid years, and some are in presidential years. A lot of the mayors are on the presidential years, but um, you are all now do you all at one time. So um, it is doable for you to get on the 2022 if you want to do that. But um, uh, currently 29 municipalities are even years now. Um, a November, um, October, November election runoff method, there are 15 currently that do that. Out of how many? 552. So a small percentage. Mm -hmm. um, Melanie, I understand yeah. that Trent Woods has already had a meeting, and what have what option have they chosen? Um, I went, oh gosh, over a year ago and presented to them, and they were going to look into going into the even years. Um, I know they were doing a lot of research on it, so I don't know if they've had their full vote yet, but um, they're still looking at going to even years. Hopefully 2022, I think, was their goal. So. Well, I think some of the municipalities around New Berlin will wait to see what New Berlin is going to do, is my understanding. But was that with a November? Did Trent Woods do with a November or an October and November? They're our only November election, but they have elections every two years. So I presented to them going to four years and then to even years. So um, they're just waiting to see what year. It's basically the addition of adding a year to your current alderman terms or taking a year away, depending on what even year you want to go to. Well, it would be different for us. We'd yeah. either have a one-year term or a five-year term, Co correct? You'd have a two-year if you... No, we wouldn't because we're you, in a... We'd go to 22, which would be a one-year term. We have to have the election in 21. Right. Correct? You'd have to... We still no. have to have the if election If you do it now, you would not. You would extend your 2019 electorals. I mean, you're 2021. Yes, you would. Sorry, I'm still thinking 2019. Right. You're correct. So we would have an election in 21, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. we would decide if it's either a one-year term to get us to 22 or a five-year term correct. to get us to 26, correct. if that's what we choose. 2024, yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. And, and Trent Woods, keep in mind, you know, smaller town, they probably have one polling site. They do. They only have one polling site, and they haven't changed aldermen in years or had so, opposition in so, years. So the cost, because they only have one polling site, that's the majority of where the cost lies in, in the programming and then ultimately the polling mm -hmm. sites and everything else that are required for them to operate. Being that we're such a larger municipality, we have multiple polling sites throughout the city. Uh, that's a lot of the cost associated with it. Right. They would say approximately three to $5,000 a year, you know, I mean, election, each election. So. Um, I, I have a, um, uh, a statement. Um, obviously, this is an election year, and, and I, I personally don't think that it would, should be us to determine what the next um, election should be. I think, respectfully, the new board should talk about this um, in regards to whether we want to move it to an even number or even change how the election goes. Um, if this is something that we wanted to do, I believe we should have did it early on. 
But I, I don't believe that us, this board, should be making that decision. I think the next board should make that decision. I, I, I agree with Alderwoman Harris. Um, we discussed this a couple years ago, and that's my biggest concern with us doing it right now is we're in the fourth quarter. If you use a sports analogy, we're in the fourth quarter of the game when we're talking about changing the rules. Um, I do think that there's a better way to do this. I do think that there's a, a cheaper way and a, a way to increase voter turnout, but um, I, I personally don't think that now is the time to make the change. We're this close to the election. My, my question for the attorney, I think I know the answer. Um, this board could ultimately start this process, change not the 21 election, but whenever the next election would be, knowing that the next board could reverse that decision, correct? Yes, sir. What, what you could do is you could ask the legislature in a local bill to give New Bern the option and add, add a fifth option. Can you, can you get to the microphone? Can you? Yes, sir. To answer your question, some local I'm bills. sorry, I didn't, hear, I didn't hear that. It was kind of muffled. Did the, the, yeah, the, yes. um, Attorney Davis say that the old, the new board can um, reject or change back to whatever type of election that they want? Y yes, ma'am. What, what, what I would suggest to you is, is an option that creates flexibility. There are two ways to do a local bill. Some local bills simply change it, and that's that. Other local bills amend the statute for the requesting city, in this case, New Bern. So the statute would say, here are the four options to have elections statewide. For New Bern, here's a fifth option. You can go to an even year if you want, and here's the process to do that. So th that would be a way to create some flexibility going forward. Now, I'm not saying the legislature would like that or the drafters would like that, but that is a legal option that they could consider. Okay, yeah, that, that, you know, that is something that I can agree with. I mean, we all would like to be on an even election so that we can get more voter, voter turnout because that's the biggest thing is making sure people come out to vote. Again, um, like Jeff said, with the Greens with me, I personally think that this is something that the new board um, should be determining. In, in response to um, Alderman Harris, um, even moving to November, your turnout's going to increase because November is in people's mind when people go vote. So if you're looking at turnout numbers as well, and it is a cost savings from going from two elections to one, um, um, approaching, you've got several decisions that you can make. And um, so you know, going broad, looking ahead to the even years, um, I would just suggest take them one at a time. So. Could, could we take a moment to let the town manager of been? Would you like to make any comments what you guys got in mind doing? Are you thinking about doing any changes? If you do, come on up to the podium. <laughs> we have not addressed this issue officially with the town council. Um, our attorney, our uh, legal firm called and notified me what the city of New Bern was considering and what's taking place in Trent Woods. And uh, so I was just, I talked to Melanie uh, this morning and wanted to come down and, and hear the input, hear the comments. And uh, I, I think that we, and I told Mark this earlier, I think this is something that I think it'd be beneficial for all the towns to collaborate, get on the same sheet of music. And so that, for that reason, uh, no matter what town you live in in Craven County, you would have the same election process and timing and those type things. Obviously, there are different concerns and political concerns um, when you move from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but officially, the town of Riverbend hasn't taken any action. We're just kind of testing the waters right now and, and seeing what other towns are doing. But I do think it would be a perfect opportunity for us to collaborate. My only, this is my concern for the moment, and um, I do not have a dog in this fight. I'm not going to have a dog in this fight. But what I'm concerned about is the cost savings. When I think about saving $40,000 in election money, that's money that, as we've seen in the last year, for projects in our community, you know, in any various wards, I just can't see us moving forward, continuing to spend forty to $60,000 when we can move to an even year 
and and go to an even year and move that and have the funding in November, not have the two elections. That's where the cost comes in. You know, if we only have to pay for ballots, to me that's that's being a good steward of our citizens' money. And it, it's about how we spend that money, and I think that's what's important. I'd rather take that $40,000 and put it in a community fund and allow some of our community needs to be met you know, every year versus spending it on an election. That's, that's just my personal preference. So the only way Melanie really could do this is there's only two options for us, really. We, we can move it to November, and then the next election, that it would be a one-year term, or we can move it to November and the next election would be a five-year term, correct? If you're trying to get it on 2022. You can and always go to 2024 or go to 2026 if you're willing to go the, to The advantage of going to 2022 would be, and doing it in November would be, we would share the cost with all the other municipalities that's in Craven County? No, even year, the only cost you would incur is ballot costs. Moving it to November, you would share with all the other municipalities. Currently, if your October is you only, you pay for everything. Yeah, well, that's what I said, if we move it to November. Correct, in November then you would share. The only thing would be specific is certain things that are specific, and that's and if we moved it, if we moved it to November of 2021 for a one year term, what, year. Kind of, what kind of savings, or what would that cost? I, I know it's probably here. It's changed a little bit due to some restructuring, but the um, overall cost savings, if you just had the October election and moved to the November election, the estimated cost for the November election is going to be about $2,400. Um, the November, if you had that, it's about $40,000. So. so wait a second, I think we, which, so if we do it in October, we're saving $2,700? If you do it in October, it's With estimated about $41,000. To cost us $41,000. Mm -hmm. But if you moved it into November, it's only cost you about an estimate of $24,000. $24,000. Mm -hmm. But then in an even year, if we, when we move forward in an even year, it will only cost us roughly $5,500 mm -hmm. to do it in November of an even year. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I understand. Or a primary even even years so, yeah but there are four methods Bobby y'all currently do election runoff um, but if November is plurality top vote getter wins that's two what you're having to look at not to make this more complex but again the statute gives us four options to choose from there is not a November then a runoff option Right, so we are on the October runoff method so that our runoff is actually on election day. So when you're comparing these numbers and we talk about moving to November, we're assuming you move to November, you have a plurality vote with no runoffs. If you want to move to November with a runoff, it's gonna take a local bill to allow for that because it's not currently allowed and then you have to add the cost for that runoff. So we're not comparing apples to apples. Well, Mr. Davis, along those lines, the, the nonpartisan versus partisan, we could not have a, a primary like, you know, typically in a even years you would have a primary in the spring and then a runoff in the fall. But that would only be with a partisan election. You can't do that with a nonpartisan. Is that correct? Um, let me ask you this. What the Supreme Court ruling on the I court. have another would like to speak again. Oh, yes, ma'am. Go, go ahead. Right. So um, to, to what Alderman Bingo was saying about the savings, I totally understand. However, we do have a fund balance, and if we wanted to put funds into a community fund, we could have done that. I feel because this is our last year, and whoever plans to run again has a dog in the fight. I don't think it's ethical for us to change anything. I think the new board should have the right to do that. I don't think that we should change anything. I think the new board that gets elected should be the ones that make the decision if we're going to change to an even year, to November, to plurality. I, I think respectfully that that's something that we have to do. I'd like to make a statement. Based on what I'm hearing and what I'm listening to right now, uh, I agree with Alderman Harris. I agree with Alderman Odom. Um, 
we have what you call a nonpartisan election. And it has been that way for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, at the end of the game, the rules, we're ready to change the rules at the end of the game. Uh, I think that decision should be made up to the next board, not us making rules for the next board to come in that they can actually change. Uh, I believe in change, but what is our budget a year that the, it would affect us, uh, Mr. Manager? Um, so every four years we have... Um, no, no, I'm talking about our budget every year. What is our budget every year? Is it over $100,000? A million dollars? You're talking and about we, the, f the full city's budget? Yes, sir. It's about $127 million. So the change would be good, but, I mean, is that something that's going to really affect us and hurt us? No, sir. Okay. So that's just my point in case. Right. And in... in um, Following on you, if you move to November, you would still be nonpartisan. All you're really doing, looking at, is just not having the runoff. It's winning by plurality. I think we should just stay where we are and let the, let the new board come in and make a decision based on what the needs will be at that time. But making a, a decision at the end of the game for someone else to come in, I don't think that's the right thing to do. I agree, all the I've often wondered for cities like New Burnett are thinking about making any changes what the, the Kinston Supreme Court ruling has to do. Did they not want to go from partisan to nonpartisan? Are you familiar with that? Are you familiar with it, Mr. Davis? Yes. Well, I, I've always wondered if, uh, as I recall, and I might be wrong, I think they were wanting to go from partisan to nonpartisan, and the Supreme Court ruled they couldn't do it for some reason. I know that in the past there's always a push to make a lot of the things partisan again. So, um, well, I, I was surprised at the ruling, but it, as I recall, they were not allowed to go to nonpartisan. So, sorry. if you if you got it one way, you know you, want, you know you have to consider that according to case law. I would I would say. And I and I will continue always presenting towns when I give them their budgets. Always presenting the different choices. Um, I, to be fiscally responsible, I feel that's my duty to let you know the cost of elections and options. Scott, you, you mentioned those four that are options that are available through the general statute. Anything other than that would require a local bill. So we could, theoretically, this board, the next board, could say we want to preserve the runoff. However, we want our election to be on an even year when the county has their partisan primary and then we would have a runoff whenever they have their general. That's an option, but it would require a little bill. I, I don't think that, I think that Kinston ruling might preclude you from being able to do that. Is it possible also as well, I'm just curious, you know, we talked about budget years and, you know, the budget ends in June. Is it possible, it would still cost us money to almost have a May May primary and then a June election to, to do something like that and seat us in July versus, you know, a May, a May election where you may only have two people running and then you've basically got a lame duck board for six months uh, working on things when you've elected, potentially could elect a whole new board at that May during that, I guess, primary I thought about that but issue. That that could be. I would think challenging. really, whatever you present to the legislature, if they it could pass it. It passes. Okay. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So. They're, they're going to tell you that you have to go from nonpartisan to partisan. Right. To I do agree. It. And I hope we never ever change the nonpartisan. I hope we never go to partisan. But I think you, it, can't, you can't do that now. Well, I think that it's in the best interest of the city for us to run as as we are and not associated with a partisan issue. I think it makes it better to serve our constituency. Well, at That's any time, of course, um, I'm here to serve, and if you ever need numbers, at any time you'd like to discuss or make decisions on this, I can always um, prepare numbers for you, so. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think that, you know, this is good that we've had a workshop at, to, to discuss this and to continue discussing. It doesn't mean that if we don't make a decision today that we can't make a decision. We obviously have um, 
some items that have been brought up that maybe staff and uh, you know might want to do a little more research on but um i don't think we're close we have to close the door on any anything we're going to do um by not doing it today at the workshop so um other i i've, I've always thought that two things could make government better in Newburgh, north carolina number one is that everybody was voting in, in november when everybody you know is is kind of cultured to do that and the second thing um, for other for other cities in the area, River Bend, uh, Town Trent Woods, Bridge, and others to all collectively be voting the same day. You know, there are folks in different areas of Newburn proper that are very concerned about leadership in Newburn and are not aware of the fact that they don't even live in Newburn. But again, I, I, I think it gives us all a working opportunity to make the public more aware of how governments do function and who is your representative, be it a, a resident of uh, the county in, in Fairfield Harbor or the town of River Bend or the town of uh, Bridgeton or um, Trent Woods, et cetera. Mayor. Melanie, what other towns and municipalities have an election this year? This year? Yeah. Everyone in but here in this county? The only ones that will not be having an election in 2021 is Cove City and Vanceboro. But everyone else will be, but in November. If, if you stay with the October, yours will be October, then if you have run off November. So. Okay, thank you. Can I um, say something? I'll be back. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, you know, I, I, I concur with um, having the election yeah, in an even year in November, we'll get a better voters turnout and also sharing the cost. But um, <laughs> I'm not good with, you know, making this change this year for us. Um, I think the new board should, should handle that process. I think, uh, looking back, I think some of the reasons we're, where we are in the third year of this cycle is that when a new board gets on, you know, there's normally a couple of new elected officials and they have new fresh ideas and the, the remaining aldermen elected officials have ideas they're trying to continue to, to bring to closure, fruition. And so I think what I'm trying to say is that I think it's even in the case of this board. I think we, we've talked about this, but we had so, so many other issues come up along the way, the, the hurricane and other items that we kind of, you know, probably put this one on the back burner. It's nothing, uh, looking back, it'd be really nice if we'd done something a couple of years ago, but I think the next board's going to find the same thing. They're going to they're gonna all come into office, whoever that might be, and there are going to be some very pressing issues that, unless the new board um, you know, really takes a hold of this and runs with it, it's, it's going to be easy to put it off to the side with other issues. Whatever, this, um, whatever you decide, your election board's here to run your elections fairly and accurately how you want them to be ran. So. And you do an excellent job, Melanie. I want to thank you for your, you and your staff. They do an excellent job. Plus, you, you do a very good, um, your singing events are very good, also, whatever they may be. <laughs> so, do we need to give guidance or what? It's up to the board for a continual discussion of this topic. I, don't, I, don't, I think we've had the discussion we need to have today, and I don't think there's anything that needs to maybe move forward unless you know it's, it's necessary to do so I think we've all stated our case um, but we have other items on the agenda I believe that may require legislative action is that correct uh, yes ma'am and uh, I, I guess I would just uh, strongly encourage if the board um, on this item number one um, what I'm kind of getting a sense of is that there will be no changes to the election process but if there's going to be changes considered, it really needs to be done very, very, very soon. 
uh, because that needs to be submitted to the state legislature. Scott needs to work with their their legal staff to get it before our legislators and so forth and so on. So regardless, and even the next topics that we discuss, if it's legislative. Okay, but one question. So if if there was a move to change it from October to November, same same process, and even you know, of a year, we don't need legislative approval. So that would just be a vote of this board for this year, correct? There's a statutory process we have to follow: public hearing, notice, document resolution. Understood. But yes, but, but no, no legislative action. approval for that. Only if we change the term, length of term, to even years. Yes, correct. Or okay. change the term. Yes. All right. Thank you. Term or even. Years. I have a question. If it, if it gets changed to November, is there still a runoff? No, no ma'am. Okay, thank you. Are there questions that the board might have that they would like to get answers from the staff? Time is of essence if we were going to make any changes. Yes, sir. Mayor, I would just say I've, I've been selfishly um, and transparently, <laughs> I've been an advocate of the runoff. I wouldn't be here without one. Um, we started this discussion a few years ago, and I said that was a sort of a non-negotiable for me was a runoff. I understand that we're in a very slim minority um, of municipalities that have that, but um, I'm a true believer that at the end of the day, when you have that election at the end, the, the citizens have an opportunity to have their voice heard for ultimately the candidate they want to support them. My, my last comment would be a recommendation to the city manager. Uh, for whoever that new board may be, I would put it on their work session or their retreat for their first um, February retreat in 2022 that all this information be presented and implore them uh, that time is of the essence to make this change and not get caught in the situation we're in where you're asking you know, to potentially change it last minute. I, I agree, and if we're going to make any decisions, I would make a motion that we allow the next board to handle this. I have one question to follow up to that, Alderman Odom. Um, I don't have an issue with that, but my question is, is if this term, if this group would be elected in 21, this election, can you elect, can you change that? Would they have to serve the four-year term out before, so you'd have to get to 23? Or no, excuse me, 25, before you can change it to an even year, don't you have to, do you have to fill out, that would be a legal question, do you have to fill out the term that you were elected to, the full four-year term, in the middle of your term, can you change it to a five-year term or a one-year term, can you do that, to no get idea. to the even year? No idea. Okay. Well, that would be a question I would like to know, because then are we kicking the can, you know, regardless, the next board needs to know, are they kicking the can down the road? If they do want to get to an even year, that means they have to wait four more years to make a decision for a one-year or a five-year term to get to the even year. So I just think that's information that would be, yes, you know, and, and that's also a question you might ask the local delegation, because I, that, that may be an, e an equally political question as a legal question. Yeah. I just, just know if you could change your right. length of a term in the middle right. of a term. I, I'm not aware of a constitutional pr prohibition against that, okay. but I can certainly see a lot of political reasons why that would be a bad precedent to have the citizenry elect someone for a given term and then have the deal right. changed. And I that. think that was the impetus. I know that I brought it forward. That was my impetus to say, how are we going to set, if we are going, if we agree that we want to go to the even year, then let's go ahead and set that term to get to the even year, either one year or five year, right. so that you're not kicking that can down the road. Right. That was my only um, movement in doing that was so that decision, you know, could be moved, done going forward. Back to Alden Odom, I came in the same way, and I believe that keeping it the way it is. And when that time comes, whoever's elected at that time, that would be up to them to make the decision. It's not for us to decide when or how. Let them take charge like we have. We had the opportunity and other things came forward that we had to take care of. So let's do the best we can with what we got and move on. 
just uh, uh, to uh, honor Ms. Ray's time uh, and her other commitments, or any other questions for her, so that uh, if not, she can be excused to go ahead and go to her other meeting. Uh, we can continue the discussion if the board wishes to do so. But we'll Thank you. Ma'am. I kind of like having the county employee that's being paid by the county on our watch. Can we keep her a little bit longer? It doesn't happen very often. Any time you want me to. <laughs> of course, I'm here. Any questions, you shoot me an email and I'll try Thank to help you. you find some answers. Thank you. Thank you. Well, of course, I'll do whatever the, the board feels is best to do, but $40,000 is a good down payment for a police officer or a firefighter or a public works person. And if we are among the only few cities in the state of North Carolina that's doing it this way, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't move to a November election anyway. So, uh, even though our budget, Johnny Ray, is millions and millions and millions of dollars, forty thousand dollars would would clean that ditch out behind your house. <laughs> you know, so that's uh, that's the way I feel about it. Thank you. Is that every year or every four years you're talking about? Every year. I, I don't understand why we're trying to portray that as as a message because if these things need to be done. We have a fund balance to do it. So, that I mean, I don't believe that we should be trying to, you know, we got to be transparent. We are a board that has an election. I'm, really, I'm running again. There's a few of us that are running again, and I don't think it's ethical for us to sit here and change because you don't know if the new board is going to decide to shorten their term to 2024. So, we, I mean, we have to be realistic, and even the information from the census is not going to be available. So there may be people that would like to run in the next election for a certain ward, and they don't know which ward they're going to be in. I think respectfully, we need to wait until next year. That's how I feel not for the next ward, and that, that's how I feel, and I think citizens would agree to that. I don't think changing the wards has anything to do with the, with the election this time. I mean, that's not going to happen. So it's, you know, and we're talking about changing it from an October vote to a November vote. That doesn't have anything to do with whether the wards are realigned or not. It does because it talks about a runoff election. You're trying to take the runoff election. That's too political. That I mean, we, we shouldn't change anything. We need to leave it the way that it is. Well, how many how many municipalities did she say in the state of North Carolina had a runoff election? Was it twenty? Why do we always have to compare I mean, ourselves to 15. other cities? New Birth to be progressive and stay the way that they are. I didn't hear anything he said, but there's only fifteen. There's only fifteen municipalities out of five hundred and fifty that do it the way we're doing it. And, and I believe that the next board should determine if it's going to be a November election. I don't think we have the right. We have the right, but I don't think we should morally change anything from this election. We got the right to do anything we want to do, as long as the board approves it. Right. I corrected myself. I know we have the right, but morally, I don't think that we should. There's some of us that have a dog in the fight, and we, we need to be transparent. Well, this, I think this whole thing is transparent. I don't know where you, why you think it's not, but it, it is transparent. I mean, that's why we're sitting here in this meeting right now. So are we going to do a motion and call a vote to change it to November? Apparently I not. We're, I, don't th I don't think we, we're ready to do that. I, um, we, we could do that in a month and still be within the boundaries. We've got until, I think Melanie said May when she wants to do the bouts if we want to change this year's date. I think it's something we should digest, you know, information. I'd like to do a little more research and get some more information. Scott, what, when would be the last moment that we would need to take action on that particular item? What would be the deadline? Because filing, Mary Melody's gone, but when is filing? Is July, it? not till July. I, I'd have to look at the statute. Um, I don't recall. If, 45 day notice for a public hearing, maybe more of those more than 10 and less than 45 days. I don't know, but you'll have you'll have you'll have uh, four to eight weeks of just procedural steps to go through. So I would work backward from that. So at least that would provide us some time to talk to our constituents and see yes. how they feel about yeah. it. Right. Say April, May is probably a good timeline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. April is. 
And I guess I'm going to try to get the information on the length of term. That's what I want to research. Can a term be changed in the middle of a term? That's my only other question. I think that question has already been answered. I don't think you can. I don't know. That's what I want to find out. If you can't answer that, I It'd be kind of awkward like to, for the sitting board to change their term to make it a longer term. I agree. Yeah. But I want to know if that's a, you know, if they're missable or not. Okay. Yeah. Anything else concerning this item uh, at this time by the board? There are other, any other topics requiring legislative action? Um, yes, Mayor. Uh, I think there were several items uh, the board had brought up. Uh, I know uh, Scott's kind of prepared for several. Um, I, I want to respect the board's time and, and what your desires are and which ones you want to cover. Uh, we've kind of prepared for as best we can uh, the potential myriad of questions or options that might come out with regards to charters. But uh, some of the things that we have discussed in the past are uh, special legislation regarding boats and removal of boats and waterways. Uh, we've talked about sidewalk and sidewalk requirements as far as payment in lieu of actually installing those sidewalks. And then we've talked about uh, briefly about uh, uh, potential changes to police civil service board. We've got the respective department heads here to answer as many questions as we potentially can. Uh, and Scott's here as well. I don't know if there's any specific one you want us to hit on first uh, in respect of your time, but uh, we're prepared to try to answer some of those if you wish. Well, I want to be respectful. Alderman Harris, um, I know you are, I believe you're on a lunch hour or whatever. I want to be respectful. Do we have time to take these options up or should we continue yep. this to another meeting? No, nope, I'm here. Okay. Well, I'd like to talk about the boats first since that seems to, that might be an easy one to talk about. And I get asked about that all the time, the removal of boats. What do we need to do? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, uh, I know Foster's here as well. He and I have both been talking about this issue for, for a, a great long time. Um, we would suggest that we ask the legislature for a local bill to authorize the city to um, not only be able to remove boats from within our jurisdiction, but also to regulate boats, much like minimum housing um, is regulated, um, which is effectively what the, 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 the local bill um, does for the town of Beaufort. Um, and there are a few other towns now. Um, we're aware of Manio that has one as well. Um, Mayor Ford, to my attention, uh, a month or two ago, uh, an email from a group who will be actually helping remove some vessels from our waterways. They were under the impression that there is a statewide statute. Um, we've not been able to locate it. Um, we've asked them to forward it to us. They have not. So I'm thinking there might be a miscommunication there. Obviously, if a statute turns up, we don't need that local bill. But um, it would be something nice to ask for. And we're not reinventing the wheel. We're simply asking for exactly what Beaufort and Manio have. Well, along those lines, uh, you know, I know the city does not want to go out and get a boat, crunch it up, and then find out that the gentleman uh, owner, uh, for some unforeseen reason, uh, had to sickness or whatever, leave for 31 days, and on the 30th day we went and demolished their boat. At the same time, on the flip side of that pancake, uh, if somebody leaves a boat out, and it's, it's littered just like a cigarette butt, and it costs us sixty-eight hundred dollars to you know to take it out to the landfill and all those other things. I want to go after them for the money. And somebody owns these boats, and I'm kind of getting sick and tired of people saying they don't because you know that thing is registered with the NC Wildlife Commission, and if it takes uh, you know any any car out here abandoned. <laughs> There's a process for that. I mean, unfortunately, boats is probably a little more difficult and problematic than getting a record to go off onto the side of the road and pick a car up and take it to a local impound place. So, um, you know, I, I just want to, in New Bern's law, um, I want the ability, if, if we can, to collect damages. Absolutely. Yes, sir. And, you know, it's just a little bit disingenuous that the, the Coast Guard will go and be concerned enough about a boat blocking not necessarily a channel because they will move it in that case but the only thing they're worried about is pumping it out making sure there's no contaminants in the river but other than the safety and welfare of somebody you know 
in the evening, uh, just hitting this thing and getting causing safety issues. Uh, I, I haven't quite fought, figured that one out yet. This this is going to continue to be a dangerous situation, and obviously um, areas like Oriental in particular, other than the fact they don't have very big har a big harbor area. Um, Newburn's got some real potential issues dealing with this. Yes, sir. Scott, wouldn't this be a lot easier if we asked the county to join in on this as well? And the reason is, is a, the boat may be anchored 10 foot out of our jurisdiction, and, but it's still an eyesore to you know, the citizens of Newburn. So. Yes, sir, and I believe from recollection from one of our prior meetings, the county has a statute that the county could, could take some of this action right now. Not, not, not everything we're talking about, but some of this action. But again, you're, you're, you're talking about uh, a big project for the county. That's a, a lot of waterways for them to deal with. Okay, so is the board, do you need further direction that we want to go after a bill? Yes, yeah, so the direction, what we could do is we could scramble together a resolution to put on your upcoming agenda. So I don't need a vote now, but if, if absent any objections, we will prepare a resolution to this effect to put on your agenda that you will then vote for at your next meeting. Well, and it will include giving us the authority to recoup our expenses from the owner? It will, and that, that's currently in, in, the, in, this, in the models that I'm talking about, they have yeah. those. Um, and again, I, I want to be clear, we'll, we'll, we'll ask for not only the, the cost and expense, but also legal fees. All that's great. It doesn't mean we'll ever see the money, but certainly sure. we ought to have that as a tool, but generally, um, when it comes to like unfit dwellings and abandoned vehicles that we deal with, the reason property gets in that state is the folks don't have any money or they're very hard to find. So finally, the lawsuit's easy. Getting the money is a different story, but certainly we want that tool. All right, next issue. Well, do you need direction as far as bringing, I mean, is this something that you'd have to bring to a regular meeting? We'd have to vote on it so you could send? Yes, ma'am. That's okay. what I said. Absent an objection right now, gonna I'm going to prepare a resolution okay. that will be on Tuesday's agenda. You may change your mind between now and then. Perfectly fine. I just don't want to waste my time doing something that's dead right this minute. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, Scott, along those lines, I do know that both for years ago ran into a situation where they were kind of killing the goose that laid the golden egg that uh, there was the concern, concern about boats being docked and then uh, there was a proliferation of sorts of those boats and I think dock owners and others were thinking maybe they need to go dock a boat somewhere and then the economic trickle down of the of all the factors dynamic associated with boating they decided, I think, to back off, and so I, I no way want this bill that you're going to process or ordinance to preclude the um, the harmony and uh, pursuit of happiness of those that want to come to Newburn on a boat, and and you know if they dock it 200 feet off and have a light on and all the other things that the NC Wildlife wants and all that. We're not in any way trying to preclude folks coming up and over in a boat. We're trying to preclude folks that are abandoning boats from making Newburn an unsightly to where people won't want to come up here in a boat and enjoy our city. Yes, sir. Um, t two thoughts to that point. Um, first, um, the, the ordinance making authority is quite broad so that if they pass the local bill and give us that authority, we'll write our own regulations um, they just give us the authority. In other words, they don't hand us the template that tells us exactly how we have to do it. Secondly, um, and I'm glad you said that, Mayor, in this process, um, assuming it gets some traction, I will have a draft bill to present to the board so that we'll all see it and talk about it before the legislature finally takes it up. So if you launch me on my way next Tuesday, it doesn't mean I'll come back with it done. It means I'll, I'll involve you um, at the various milestones so that you will always know what's happening. Okay. Um, Mr. Stevens, a sidewalk issue. What, what did you want to need to state? 
the guidance on that? Yes, sir, quickly. Um, the, the question comes up from time to time as to whether cities have the legal authority to charge developers for sidewalks that will not be installed on their property immediately. We do have the authority in our development statutes to adopt ordinances to require developers to install sidewalks as part of their approval process. We currently have that. The odd situation you get, and Highway 55 corridor is a, is a perfect example, the odd situation you get is that property doesn't develop linearly from the hub out to the spoke, right? It develops haphazardly. So you will see sections along Trent Road sections along portion of Oaks Road where sections of sidewalk exist that connect to nothing. We have a solar farm project out at the end of Highway 55 within our jurisdiction that is probably a mile or two from Bosch, the nearest sidewalk. So our current rules we require them to build that sidewalk and it will sit for maybe decades until something connects to it. Something for the board to consider is whether the statute, we could ask for a statute that gives Newbern the authority to, to charge that developer for the sidewalk that they were going to install and then more systematically construct those sidewalks from the hub out the spoke so that we have some continuity. And there are different ways to, to think about how you do that, but step one is having the authority to make that assessment, bankroll the money that you can then use to match funds for grants and use to, to make that money grow that might help us get certainly sidewalks developed in a more consistent fashion, but possibly get more sidewalks because then we have developer funds in the bank that we can use to match other grants. So let me understand, the, the developer this 10 miles away from the nearest sidewalk is going to pay for the sidewalk in front of his business. Right. So we can go 10 miles up the road and then extend the sidewalk towards him a couple hundred feet maybe. That's right. And, and to your point, a lot of developers, um, what you imagine is developers getting angry about that. I'm giving you $50,000. I want my sidewalk. Um, ironically, their first pitch back to me is, can't I just give you some money? and not do this because this makes no sense. It's going to make my property look funny. It's going to be a blight on my property. If the city's not going to come and maintain that sidewalk, I'm going to have to edge it and deal with the weeds. If I'm, if I'm legally bound to spend $50,000 here, just take it and save me the hassle of building the sidewalk. So in the developer community that I've talked to, and the reason I'm bringing this up is every six months I have to take an earful for why are we doing this? And the follow-up always is, I'd rather just give you some money and move along. So, but you, you may well, since you are the public officials, you may want to reach out to your constituents and your developer constituents to get their take on this. I'm sure their first pitch is, let's do away with sidewalks. But if we're going to have sidewalks, I suspect they might see the logic of doing it this way rather than the current way. Do other communities, I mean, can we look to other cities, other municipalities that are doing it this way? Or we, would we There are a be... couple other, and I'm, I'm, I, I want to say Cary, um, but I could be wrong on that. There are a couple other sites. Uh, we had Statesville where I came uh, from originally um, yeah. uh, to Newburn from. Uh, we had a payment in lieu of uh, statute, I guess, or charter uh, provision that allowed for developers to pay into a fund. Then at that point, it could be utilized uh, for sidewalk development. And, and they were in situations too to where uh, the construction of sidewalks sometimes become very cost prohibitive, i.e. if it was on the sidewalk that had a two to one slope and you only had a five foot shoulder, it was gonna cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a retaining wall to build a sidewalk on that side. So therefore they would pay in lieu of to put it on the other side of the road where they might fit it or something like that better. Okay, so let me understand something. So by moving in this direction, then the developer would be relieved of having to build the side. So the sidewalk would, the sidewalk they were originally intending, supposed to build, would not happen. 
and then they would pay into a fund that potentially at some point we would build sidewalks. Yes, ma'am, and, and, may, and, and as, as the city manager is pointing out, that sidewalk may traverse their property or it may be on the other side of the street, which may be more log logical and more efficient to build. Well, this is an impact fee is it, what it is. Exactly. That's it's exactly, an impact fee. That's right. And uh, the North Carolina Association of Realtors, the home builders are totally against impact fees. Now, um, I, I can see where in some hardship situations, as Ms. Stevens indicates, where it's uh, cost prohibitive to install a sidewalk, uh, that the developer could be given the option of paying into a fund if they wanted to. Uh, but at the same time, this whole idea, uh, Mr. Rogeri, it took him years to convince me of, of how important it is to have sidewalks in Newburn. Um, I, you know, the, the whole pro rata formula of uh, one guy's going to build a, a small store, he's going to replicate it on the other side of town, same small store, 400 feet of frontage on one location, 75 feet on another. You know, there's nothing equitable about building a sidewalk, um, and and that's site specific to to real estate itself. So, um, I, I would not have a problem if the individual developer wanted uh, to to uh, have the option of of in lieu of. But at the same time, I think that money should stay within that ward, and it should be maybe the opportunity for that alderman for that ward to decide it because it's hardship reason why they might would want okay. yes sir and that's why I, I started with the, the details of the program is a whole separate issue because what you're going to find as you think it through is that it may not even be ward specific it may be corridor specific and the corridor traverses multiple wards um, but, but yet that's a detail but we can't even get to that detail if we don't have the legal methodology as an option well it's kind of inconsistent now anyway I think isn't it because I'll give you an example of that Harris Teeter gas station that's out in Carolina Colors. They got this silly little sidewalk running right now in front of their place, but then the, the parcel right beside it, which is a bank, has never put a sidewalk in at all. <laughs> so, and then you got the church out on Oaks Road that's got all this sidewalk running down in front of them. There's not a sidewalk within 10 miles of them. So. Yes, sir. And, and, and that, that's the first bite of the elephant was starting the rule for just this reason. The people who built last month didn't have to build sidewalks. You're changing the rule on me that the city did a number of years ago. Now I've got to build a sidewalk. So the board took the first big bite, as the mayor points out, of requiring sidewalks. Now the question is, are we happy with what we've got or do we want to allow for an opportunity to create a fund to, to make the construction more logical? Because to your point on, on, in Carolina Colors, that bank never has to build a sidewalk. It will never exist. So the taxpayers, wow. the taxpayers, the city will pay to connect that wow. sidewalk for the gas station at some point in time. Why? Wow. Um, because there's no one else to pay for it. You, you, you can't impose a fee on, on an existing business that got there when it complied with the rules. That's a brand new bank. Oh, I'm just sorry. Built I, thought, it. I thought it was, I, I thought from Jeff it was, it was an old bank. The first citizen, I think it's the first citizen of the bank right in front of the Harris Teeter. It's only been open a couple of months. It may be that it's, it, 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 it may be that, well, it could have been approved a long time ago or it just may not be in yet. But if it, if it was approved and permitted in the last couple of years, it has okay, to have a so. sidewalk. And yeah. I, I will just, I will add, you know, fees for sidewalks, or let me, let me go back. Sidewalk requirements are pretty much the norm for most municipalities across the state of North Carolina for development. Um, sidewalk fees in lieu of construction is probably not as prevalent, but it exists pretty much in most of your larger municipalities, some of your more highly developed. Uh, even Mary texted me while we were talking here, Holly Springs had it, a payment in lieu of. Um, for these particular reasons, I think, you know, the, the board, you're, you're, you're stuck in a little bit of a which one do you do um, when 
two meetings ago, you approved $200,000 worth of sidewalks to go through Pembroke and out Country Club Road because guess what? We don't have sidewalks there. This is an opportunity where you have, as the mayor said, I guess if you want to count it as an impact fee, it's an impact fee, but it's a pretty consistent impact fee across the state of North Carolina for developers. It really enhances your community as far as its walkability, its accessibility, so forth and so on. So it's a delicate line and balance between being developer friendly, but also providing the public resources necessary to allow, um, as your city grows, uh, movement and, and uh, you know, transportation that is alternative to just driving a car, uh, okay. which also reduces what your future needs may be in wider roads, uh, additional stop lights and stop signals, uh, all kinds of different things, which will be future expenses that the city will have to incur if you don't have these alternative means of t transportation. So, so, just so the, the, the developer would have the option whether to, hey, I'll just build my sidewalk and be done with it, or I, I'll pay you. you. I, honestly, I think that becomes more of a, a staff at the development services review related uh, thing. If we have sidewalks in that area, why wouldn't we require them to go ahead and put it in? But if this is a situation where the solar farm is the example where it's two miles away or a mile away from the nearest sidewalk, then is it really necessary for us to do that? Then we would offer them the opportunity. That's my thought. And I don't know, Mr. Ruggieri, huh. you may agree or disagree. Well, and, and let me say this because that could be a long discussion. Yes. It's a policy issue that we can digest and reflect on, but without the legal authority, we, we don't even have to have the discussion. I certainly think that there are some times where an option might make sense and there are corridors where there's no option. It just needs to go in because we know in the next three to five years it will get built out. Uh, I'm in favor of that. Well, the only concern I have about the option, and I've mentioned the option, not being an impact, but giving the developer that opportunity. If the developer comes in and for environmental purposes or whatever else, um, infrastructure in place, uh, he, he or she gets to buy, buy out, buy that sidewalk going somewhere in that ward. Then up the road, we have a donut hole. Uh, um, it, the connectivity is there for, for this section of Newburn, except for this 200 feet. Mm -hmm. So guess who, guess who puts the 200 feet in? City of Newburn. That's right. You know, but, and so uh, again, back, this is something staff would have to kind of mitigate through if it's, uh, if it's one of those extreme hardship things, we don't want it coming back on the city. Um, I like the idea of an option, but the money remaining in the ward. And I also think the city should right now, in addition to the $200,000 budgeted item, I think it should look at uh, spending additional monies in the near future to look over Newburn at, at areas that, that is just, just a couple hundred feet or so from really connecting some areas in New Bern. Uh, and there's plenty of those that all of us can cite in our wards uh, to continue to make our city walkable. And I think too, Mayor, uh, just, uh, just to add, um, you know, we have a sidewalk and pedestrian plan. It has a case for uh, making connectivity in New Bern, looking at some of these larger corridors. I'm sure there's probably some corridor in every single ward that traverses along through there. And if there's development in an area, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a case in point. No sidewalks along McCarthy. Uh, let's say somebody comes in there and puts a dental office. They got to put sidewalks in front of it. Well, there's nothing to tie to on Glen Burnie. There's nothing to tie to on Highway 70. But you'll have a 200 foot section on their frontage there that, uh, that they got to put a sidewalk. However, if that's in the same Ward 6 area, wouldn't it be nice to go up to Highway 70 and, seven, uh, and Glen Burnie and extend that sidewalk that we've been talking about for a long time about connecting it from 70 uh, bridge over to the community college, which stays in the same ward and meets some of the consistency of what our sidewalk and pedestrian plan is. That's kind of what you could do with the potential use of funds instead of having some random 200 foot of sidewalk along McCarthy where no sidewalks exist. One, one last point that might help uh, in the discussion. Um, what I would propose is that we ask for a local bill that creates the statutory authority for the board to adopt an ordinance whenever it wants, right? So, so that's the step. So this step simply, simply would be a local law that says, Newburn, if you ever want to do this, here's something that you can do so that you then have the option. So in both, for, for example, change it. It just gives us the steps to change. That's it. right. It's it, it, same as the abandoned the abandoned uh, uh, vessel um, uh, statute. 
Uh, Beaufort got their local bill passed in the early 70s and didn't do anything with it for 25 years. So this is simply a step that gives you the ability to do it if you want to. Right now, it's simply not an option. I would say, uh, based on that, I don't have a problem with us moving forward doing that and at least giving us the authority then to debate it and decide where we want it. Just gives us the option. I'll draft it. For, I'll draft the resolution for Tuesday. You may change your mind between now and then, but if you don't, like you say, you never have to adopt it, but you'll have the ability. Okay. And part um, of that, again. Can I say something, please? Yes, ma'am. Um, just all over the bed. Um, Scott, thank you for that information, and Mark, and I, I, I concur with that. Um, that we do need to sidewalk because there are definitely some connecting sidewalks needed in Ward 5. So I agree with that. Stop getting that resolution up for us so that we can all agree on that that's most needed in the city. Okay, is, is this going to be in the guise of the impact fee or is it going to be an option, a, a developer option to either build the sidewalk or pay into the fund? It will, it will give the city the ability to have either one, whichever the board wants. Well, I can tell you, you know, if you don't have it specifically, if, if it's in any way gray, uh, I, I can tell you about three or four organizations that sure. fight it tooth and nail, so you, you waste your time even sending it up there if you don't make it an option no. type of uh, bill. Okay. Anybody else on this? Anything else on sidewalks? Uh, civil service board yes sir, I'll just I'll just stay here in the spirit of making this a little faster um, chief and I put some good time into this issue there are five cities in North Carolina that have civil service boards Asheville has a civil service board that's available to all employees of Asheville that if they are um, uh, reprimanded in certain ways demoted or terminated, they have a board to go to that can undo, uh, potentially undo that, um, um, that action. Uh, Charlotte, Wilmington, Statesville have a similar board available to fire department employees and police department employees. So if those employees have any adverse action, they have a place to appeal to. New Bern is the fifth city that um, has that same system available only to the police department. That is part of our charter. The only way to remove that is to have a local bill that would amend our charter to do away with that provision. I can tell you historically um, some of those provisions go back to the late 1920s. Others, like New Bern, came around in 1965, a year after the Civil Rights Act. My only guess, and this is just a guess because I don't have an historic study of it, uh, but um, the cities that adopted these boards right after the Civil Rights Act were designed to ensure that minorities had an opportunity to serve and not to be fired inappropriately. If you recall from 10 years ago when the statute, when the charter was amended last time on this issue, New Bern had that same two-step process where there was the Civil Service Board vetted all of the incoming applicants um, and also was an appeal board for any applicants who were sent home for a number of days or terminated. The board at that time, 10 years ago, decided to remove that first step of the process because it made New Bern very uncompetitive in trying to hire police officers because that front end vetting process could take 60 to 180 days. In the meantime, every other town near us was hiring all of the BLET graduates and we had none left for ourselves. So now we just have the back end piece that provides an appeal process um, unlike any other department in the city. So for me, it's kind of hard to verbalize a logical reason why the police department um, would be treated differently than other departments. If it's a great idea, it ought to be available to everyone. 
And if we can't point to a public policy reason um, for any particular department, it, it just leaves me scratching my head as to why the police chief has a different set of rules to live by. I think that you will find with this whole discussion that you can talk about it for about five or ten minutes and come to a reasonable conclusion or you can believe it at a point. The truth is is that um, in my in my opinion, not being privy to the results of the of these civil service board hearings, uh, I have concluded that in many instances um, the scope of what the civil service hearings are about are not germane to what the original spirit of the Civil Service Board was, and that was to uh, protect certain rights that were established with the Civil Rights Act of 64. Um, so in my opinion, if we were to uh, re refine the, the, the Civil Service Board of the City of New Bern to exclude non-civil rights matters of the Civil Rights Act 64 and other uh, later revisions, et cetera, that if we were to, to remove from the board's duties the hiring, the hiring of police officers and other non-civil rights actions uh, that the board could, could uh, operate um, more efficient, and you could get these officers hired. Uh, I think to do anything to, to totally uh, remove the Civil Service Board uh, politically is not gonna happen in New Bern, North Carolina at this time. Um, the other five, are they all for all departments of, of these cities or for just? Asheville is the only one that is citywide. The other three are police and fire only. I, I would say at the time of the city writing that bill uh, that the, the 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 needed area of reform was probably within the police department at that time is probably why it I agree. was specific just to the police I agree department yes sir and that's why the rest of the departments were not included in that yes sir Scott how how is it even legal so let's just say that there's a public works employee that gets terminated can they not turn around and sue the city that the police department has an extra layer of protection or benefit that they that we don't offer them? It's, it's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. I just don't know. But I, I, I would feel that way if, if I were an employee in another department, but I don't, I don't know the legal answer to that. Do you know if there's any other department in the city that has the backup of a union, essentially? Not, like that, I'm, not, not that I'm aware of, no. Not that I'm aware of. And, and, and let's be clear too, we are, th there is a new social movement of the last handful of years where cities are forming you know, police department review committees to improve transparency within the department. That's not what we're talking about here at all, right? This is not a social issue where we, we want to create a committee of, of citizens to give them some greater access to information within the department to make sure the department is operating efficiently and fairly. This is simply an employment appeal board. So I don't want to mix the two politically and, and create some concerns that don't exist. Well, I think I've already stated my position on it. My position would be that it, it be within the spirit of the 64 Civil Rights Act and that it not have anything to do with hiring and it not have anything to do with non-civil rights matters. Mayor, it's hard for me to hear you. Are you saying that you support a civil board that deals with the civil rights or it needs to be removed? It would be, it would be specifically, I believe the mayor is saying that it would be the idea of amending the charter to limit the police civil service board's jurisdiction to issues related to discrimination, civil rights, and those constitutional protections of the officers rather than every issue of, for the officer. But Scott, isn't that already protected? It is. It wasn't at the time, right? Right, at right. At the time of the, of the civil service board, it wasn't, and that's why this thing was enacted. Right. And uh, now today, still, uh, HR departments handle a lot of things that 
probably the civil service board is dealing with that it shouldn't be dealing with. I think I think what your point is we, we have federal laws and, and protections now in place that um, have grown much more robust in the last 55 years. So I agree with the mayor. Why don't I do this? Um, let me um, take this note and do some thinking on it and um, talk to some colleagues to see if um, if that's something that, that would be a meaningful difference to what we're currently doing. Um, and and then uh, we'll take it from there. We might miss this legislative cycle, but, but let me just see where it goes. Um, I'll well, get so your answer is going to be yes, but... Is, has the Civil Service Board in the last five years taken on cases that probably are not within the spirit of the Civil Service Board? I've not had a, I've not had a civil rights type issue come up in my entire career. So are you saying that it is doing, is having hearings on things that are not in compliance with the original intent of the, of the, civil, of the civil Service Board in Newburn? Well, I, I would be hesitant to definitively say that the the only original intent were civil rights types. Do we need to get this to the government to come in? And, and I'm, I'm not being funny here or sure. anything, but to, to see if the Civil Service Board is having hearings on things that are not germane to the Civil Service Board of the city of New York. Well, they, they don't, this, no one in the state has a perfectly clear understanding on the precise basis for the creation of these boards across the state. There are, quote, experts in my field that, that have some theories that back in the 20s and 30s, they were, they were in, in, in place to um, address union type issues to keep cities from unionizing. There are, uh, but, but that wouldn't explain why cities like New Bern, and there were others that had them in, in the mid 60s, to me, it's more than coincidental that it happened at that same time, but it could be coincidental. What I can tell you is the charter says what it says, and the reason I'm pushing back a little bit, Mayor, is if the intent was to be narrow and specific, the charter would have always been narrow and specific. It's not. It is as broad as the law allows, and I, I'm hesitant to think that those people drafting it back in the 60s had in their minds a very narrow issue and then drafted a very broad and robust so provision. So it's not an inelastic type of uh, doc document. It's very elastic. It is. It is. It's it not is. a civil rights board. It's a civil service board. It, it, that's right. That's right. And, if, and they have, I mean, if, if the chief of police finds one of his officers in violation of any type of rule or whatever that warrants dismissal, they have the right to appeal before this group of civilians that can overturn the chief's decision. That being said, I have never been contacted by as many police officers over an issue as I have this. Sure, of course. I mean, they, they, they are every, I would be willing to bet you every one of them want to keep this civil service board intact. I, I would too. So um, do, why, why would you not offer that same opportunity to the other employees of the city of Newburn then? I don't know. I mean, you can't. I mean, why, why does the I police reckon, department get it and the rest of the, of the departments don't get it? Don't know. You know I mean, it, was, it, it probably was set up years ago, like you said, to help employees. Okay, okay then let's amend this thing for everybody in the city of Newburn to be able to uh, have a check and balance of, of their job performance with well, then you might as well do away service. with all your department heads. You know, let the civil service board run the city. Because if if you do that, you won't never be able to fire anybody else. It's, you know, you oh, know. oh, okay. You answer. I heard. I heard that. Well, I'm glad I said it. I wanted you to hear it. Uh, Mr. Raven, uh, two questions, Scott. If if an employee is terminated by staff that decision is reversed by the Civil Service Board, then they overrule the staff, no questions asked. Yes, sir. That's okay. right. If we didn't have a Civil Service Board and staff made a decision to terminate a police officer, their union or their representatives can then sue the city for wrongful termination. Yes, correct? sir. Yes, sir. 
So they would still have that. Every, em every employee has all of their legal rights. You never forfeit a legal right. Except the police department is the only department in the city that has a paid group that represents them, correct? Potentially, if you're a member, yes, sir. Okay. And my last question, Mr. Stevens, um, I know you've been going through the interview process for the chief position. Has this topic come up during any of those interviews by any of the potential candidates? None. Do they, I, do honestly, they know I, that we have that? Because if I was a chief and I had my choice of several places to go, Newbern would be at the bottom of my list because of this issue, personally. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that many of them are probably aware of it. And as Scott pointed out, five out of 550-some municipalities in the state of North Carolina have it. We're one of those five. Chief, did you know that this was here when you came? No idea. Okay, thank you. Well, my comments were not about terminating the Civil Service Board. They were about refining it and re-identifying its purpose. And if somebody on a much higher level in, in uh, Institute of Government or something could help us with this situation to see what's equitable to all employees of the city, and even not just some, I, I would be interested in knowing that. Um, my, my thought would be is to eliminate the Civil Service Board being in, involved in hiring of, uh, they already are. Beg your pardon? They already are. Yeah, yeah, yeah man, we, 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 we've, already taken, we've taken that first step. Um, we, we, we now have the backside of, of the same problem. And that only civil, um, uh, 1964 civil right items be what the Civil Service Board would have hearings about. But obviously others have other opinions. So what does the board wish to do on this item? So the Civil Service Board is the one to make the decision, not the manager? That's right. Yeah, every other employee has a right to appeal from the department head decision to the city manager. Um, but police department employees um, and, go to the, to the uh, Civil Service Board. But they also, they're appealed to the city manager, but they have a hearing where they can bring on counsel and absolutely, and you're there representing That's the city, right. and their attorneys is representing them, yeah. and so it, yes, it, it, exactly, yeah, no one loses their rights. And does a police officer have that same right, or does it automatically go it to the civil automatically service? goes to the civil service okay. board? Well, a couple years ago, when Sorry, we, I, go ahead, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have a question. Is, is this are we going to have would this inquire, require a public hearing for this decision? It, it does not, um, no, no ma'am. But that doesn't doesn't mean you you cannot have one. You, you can always have a public hearing. Yeah, personally, I think with making changes like this, we you know there are big community members that are still concerned about the civil board the civil board. So I think. We should allow a public hearing to hear what the community would like us to do. Mr. Davis, how many years ago was it that we made uh, a change in the Civil Service Board that it did not get involved in the hiring? Uh, that was the last four charter years. amendment. I want to say it was 10 years ago. How long ago was it? Five, five years ago. Uh, okay, forgive me, it was five. Well, again, I mentioned that because it, 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 I keep hearing, I, I remember what we did then, but again, this is like a lot of things that we make rules about what happens after that, I'm not aware of, but I was quasi under the impression that there might be still some items associated with the Civil Service Board that involve hiring. But I, I remember what we did at that time, but I don't. Yes, sir. Totally remember. Yes, sir. We, we, we eliminated that entire step to make it much more streamlined so the chief can now make offers competitive with everyone else. That's what you were referring to, sir? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, e Mark, exactly. Is, is this going to have an effect on us hiring a, a police chief, you think? Um, I, I mean, if, if they knew about it, I think it, that, that <laughs> certainly would weigh into their decision. I mean, what I chief, I, I mean, it, honestly, um, maybe chiefs who are used to working with unions might not care one way or the other, because that's basically what you have is you'd have to go to a union board to have a union discussion. But if, if, uh, if, if as, as in case of chief's point, he didn't know, if you come in blindly and don't know, then obviously that's, that's a, that's a significant well, impact to you if you are the deciding factor as a department head into whether or not to have an employee 
that uh, is going to continue on your force or not, but then get overruled every time by a civil service board that may be more, um, I guess, biased towards police officers in some way or whatever, because you never know what the makeup of the board's going to be. They reinstate that officer, then you know he's having to deal with that. So there's there's you know, definitely some interest. Uh, I'm sure that some of those police chiefs would have in whether or not there's there's a police civil service board at your city or not. Mr. Davis, you you expressed an earlier what I would consider to be an opinion that you think that we should continue with the civil service board. Is that correct? No, sir. I I would suggest. Um, what was, the, what was your opinion? You, you expressed an opinion earlier. Well, I think uh, uh, Chief was, was mentioning that um, uh, he's received a lot of phone calls from the police department for those employees wanting to keep it. And my comment was, if I were an employee that had that extra protection, I would want it too. Absolutely. I think all, I think all city employees would, would like you know, more rules rather than fewer employee uh, rules to protect their employment. Now, I'm not saying that's correct. I'm just saying... On the employee side, more is better than less. On the employer side, you obviously lose flexibility. Well, I've, I've got a widget factory, and, and we produce widgets. And the, the division that, that makes the W-2 widget, they have a civil service board, and the three other divisions, they make the same widget, but they don't. Right. And I, I find it hard to figure out why, when somebody needs to get fired in the other three divisions, they can follow a normal labor policies and HR policies compliant with state, federal, and the company policy. But this other widget division over here has got a civil service board that says that you can't fire that person because they're inept or doing things, you know, whatever it might be. And, and that's what you have here in Newburgh. That, yeah. that is precisely why we're bringing this issue to the board. It, it, it's and hard to verbalize. That, you have to pay them all their back pay if they get reinstated. I mean, you know. And, and, and to put this in perspective, too, and Chief, I can't, I don't recall if I'm right. In the last five years, how many appeals have we had? Three, four? Yeah, so every year or two, we have one. So this is not something that we're dealing with every month, but it's. It, so if you've had five in that department, that means there's probably about 30 within the 470 employees that if they'd had that opportunity, they would have, they would have had a hearing also. Is that about right? For sure. Yeah. Well, out of those five, how many of them did the Civil Service Board overturn and give the employee the job back? Do you recall that? I believe twice. So, uh, so do you think it's important to bring the others above, above uh, uh, to have representation as well? I, I would not. If you do, we are going to need at least one more lawyer, maybe two. To, to deal with all of that because um, it's it's quite a process to set up a, an appeal board for, for all employees to appeal to. And it, sometimes it turns into a popularity issue too. You know, that police officer or the employee that gets terminated is a real popular person and knows many of the people on the board. I mean, it, it can turn into a popularity thing. It, it undermines your leadership. It, it really does. Line. But so you're saying that's not a good thing? It's, 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 been, it's been my personal experience, along with the city manager and the police chief, that it, it creates an obstacle for the chief to run his department or her department because their hands are tied with respect to personnel decisions. And the problem is, whenever a personnel decision comes up, one has to think through how that's going to work with the appeal process. And in some departments, you just come to the conclusion, this is not a good fit. I need to move on. In the police department, you may recognize this is not a good fit. I don't want to deal with three months of appeals and all that hassle. I'll just live with a bad fit, which is the reality of what happens. And, and to say this, too, and, and as a compliment to the officers, and you folks very well know the expense an investment that you make and that they make in their training, their level of expertise. Um, you know, these are not decisions that a chief makes lightly, right? The last thing one wants to do in any situation is lose any employee, 
let alone one that you've literally invested tens and tens of thousands of dollars in. So it's not something that I've ever experienced a chief, you, you know, not take incredibly seriously. When is the new chief of police going to be on board? Maybe we should wait and see, get his opinion on, on it. Well, what, what, what chief, who the president or future wants a board that circumvents or overrules or usurps the authority of the leadership of the chief? No. Well, then you don't, then you need to refine the scope of work of the civil service board and make it only associated with the Civil Rights Act of 64 and other later revisions, whatever. Um, I, I wanted to make a comment. I, I, I understand, but I, I personally don't agree. We've had an incident last year where a police officer made a, a, a racial comment and that person is still working there and the community has the right to come and, and, and state their peace. So I believe that we need to keep this board. They reinstated in that. I, I don't know that that's the intent of the Police Civil Service Board. The public does not have an opportunity to come in and speak. Yeah, so you that's the case. Quickly just state what's going yeah, on. Yes, sir. The, 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 the Police Civil Service Board is, is uh, protected by confidentiality. These hearings are held in private. Um, nothing can be disclosed that comes out of that hearing. So. As I was mentioning earlier, this is not a, a, a citizen committee to add greater transparency or communication with the police department. This is a very limited appeal board to handle private employment decisions for the officers only. We've had community members come to um, petition the citizens and, and ask that we have a, a civil war specifically for the police department so that they can have some oversight of what goes on when it comes to community policing. Yeah, that, uh, Alder Woman Harris, that's a, that's a completely different board, completely different scope of work. Um, I think uh, what you're referring to is very similar to what Scott uh, mentioned earlier, which was more like a, I guess, a community ad advisory board, or they, they they hear they hear complaints and issues related to policing, and then they report back, I guess, to the chief, or the chief reports to them to some extent, and and works with them to hear the complaints and see how they can improve the policing. This is a completely different board, nothing to do with any of that. This is strictly regarding personnel matters. That this board serves at police. Well, this one kind of caught me by surprise. I wasn't really aware this one was going to pop up. So, I mean, to be honest with you, I understand, Mayor, what you're saying exactly. I, 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 but I've had numerous police officers contact me. I don't know if the rest of you have or not asking me, please don't support anything like this. Um, I don't, and don't blame them. I wouldn't want to support it if I was in their shoes. But I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm a loss as to what to do. I mean, I respect the right of being a department head. If I terminated someone after going through all of the processes that I had to go through, you know, working with HR, HR approving all of the letters and the, the, the reprimands that go out, and we terminate someone for you know, a reason that's listed in our policies as to that they could be terminated for, and then they appeal it to a group of citizens, and the citizens said, oh, no, they didn't have a job back. I find that to be a little, it, it, it's got to be a difficult position, Chief. It really does. Would you be interested in moving forward with a revision of the current civil service board that it be brought back into the, the spectrum of what the original spirit of it? As uh, this is very elastic, as he says, it started out one thing, and it's very broad because it was not very well defined as to what 
the duties were of the Civil Service Board. So it's kind of expanded. Is that correct? I don't think in the past 30 years that the Civil Service Board has had any responsibility other than hiring new police officers or recommending to hire new police officers and listening to them after they've been terminated to give them an opportunity to get their job back. I don't think it has anything to do with civil rights. And to be honest with you, I don't think a, a civil right issue ought to be going towards a group of, of civilians anyway. They need to be handled by our attorneys. So, um, Sound me like you, I just heard you say we don't need a civil service board, but that's well, what I heard you I, say. I, you didn't hear me say that, but I can, <laughs> I, I can understand, I can understand the reason why the chief of police Make, it makes it difficult for the chief of police to to do his job knowing that a group of citizens could overturn his ruling. Could, could I make a suggestion, Scott? Would the next steps be the board pass a resolution to dissolve the Civil Service Board? Is that what would it would be? It would be to ask the local delegation to amend, assist in amending our charter to remove that provision from our charter. Could we, could we put that on a future meeting to allow us some time to, to talk? Because every one of those employees, Bobby, that called you and want you to keep it, if they got promoted to chief tomorrow, they'd want you to eliminate it. I agree with you, sir. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. I agree with you. And, and if the board does not go forward with it, I want each and every one of us to, to, to deep within ourselves question why we would give one department a, a check and balance that all departments don't get. You know, it's kind of interesting. It reminds me of when the, the assembly required the municipality to give I, I have, 401k I, I funds to police officers and no other city employee. And the city stepped up to the plate at that time and said, if we're going to give it to the police officers, we're going to give it to the rest of the employees. So it's, it's basically. I, I have a question. When, when a police officer does something in public that needs to be reprimanded and it's been done in public, why does the public not have the right to see how everything um, pans out in that regard? And when it comes to civil rights, we need to still have a civil service board. And the police are here to protect and serve the community and all citizens. And I feel like why are we trying to take all these rights away from our citizens? We should allow them a public hearing and voice their opinion. Because again, we represent the individuals in the ward and the city holistically. And we should not be making these decisions without having our citizens come up and speak their piece because that is who we ultimately represent. Yes, ma'am. It, it's Scott again. The, um, we have a state statute um, that makes it a crime to disclose personnel information that's not the most basic information, such as name and job and, and pay. So we, we, we cannot share um, any kind of action uh, involving employees with the public, unfortunately. So what do you want to do, Mr. Mayor? Okay. Um, Mr. Davis, what would you like? To well, well I, th I think what I'm hearing is we're going to put a pin in this last issue. I'm going to bring you resolutions on the other issues, um, and we are going to maybe um, keep some traction and some life on this issue um, for to give you guys time to do some more reflection and talking um, and give me direction at a later date. We might miss this legislative session, or we might not. That's, that's what I'm hearing, and I could be wrong. Can, can you give us a sample? Uh, resolution maybe not sure don't, don't put it on the agenda just give us something what it what it might how it might look like how it might read sure I yeah. think that would be helpful it's gonna be three sentences it's just gonna say you know hereby delete section five of the charter to remove the police civil service board oh. well I, I will just tell you from my perspective I, I'd appreciate some research with the Institute of Government for them to if we had to pay for them to do it to review over the, the past 10 years of what's been going on there and see if that's, um, and if it's congruent with uh, what other, what what the spirit of the rich, it, all we can do is base it on what our civil service board is and is instructed to be. And uh, maybe get a, um, you, you know, our other air departments disenfranchised by not having that opportunity, et cetera. And just have a broad legal, perspective opinion on 
on the city of New Bern and it's, it's present specific to only one department, et cetera. I think you've heard enough discussion here. You know what might be some good things to get some questions answered. I know that in the past, some things that have come up, we have um, gotten some information back from them that has been helpful to us in making our decisions. Why don't we ask the board how they feel about it? I mean, ask, the, ask the board how they feel about this. Do they want to disband it? Or are they more no. interested in letting it be? Or the, um, let it stay as it the, is? Or, or civil service board? The civil service board. I mean, there might be enough interest in the board to do away with it. Well, um, I, I, you know, I really, really I hate to get into that one other than to say I think the discussion I've heard is the composition of the Civil Service Board and who should be a member of it um, and what background. Should it be, uh, as in the case of the appraisal board or real estate commission, non-member uh, members uh, that are objective or should it be comprised of, of, of retired police officers or should it be comprised of no police officers? In other words, um, you're really opening it up when you start asking the board because I guess it would depend on where a particular board member's coming from. I don't know of any police, uh, I, I don't want to speak for police officers, but I don't know of any retired officer that would be on the civil service board in the city of Newman that would be against a civil service board other than if they were at one time the chief. Now I can see where if they a former chief was on that, that they might would be against the civil service board. But I don't think the rank of file would be. But I think you have enough yes, information sir. that we probably have. Uh, I, I have one more question, Scott, not about this board, but um, I don't think it would require legislative action, but I want to ask since we're discussing it. The Appearance Commission, can right, someone sir. explain to us maybe what the goal and purpose of the appearance commission is because I know I think it's changed over the years and it's one that we have constant turnover on. Right. Is, is that we discuss that legally in this meeting? This is only legislative type uh, items can be discussed. We can discuss it. We just can't take action on it. Um, but I can make it quicker. Um, we have a statute that lays that right out. Let me email it to you. Okay. Um, I, I don't have it memorized, um, but the statute lays out the things that it can do. It's pretty broad, but broadly, it's appearance. Some communities call them the tree board because they just do trees. Others do things more broadly. But let me shoot this statute. So we're not legally required to have one. I'll, I'll double check. I'm 99% sure it is an option that the, the statute gives you if you want it. Disbanding it would not be. Wrong. I think to be a member of that Audubon and some of those groups that tree city and all that, I think you have to be an appearance committee. There may be a catch with that exactly that it gives us a box to check because we have one. Uh, was started back in the 80s, I know, um, when Ella was the mayor. It was one of her projects, and um, they started from there. I've got a folder full of information. I'm happy to share that. Sure. Thank you. What other items do you have, Mr. Stevens? Uh, that's all we have, sir, unless the board uh, has any other items uh, they want to discuss. May I make a motion to adjourn? Second. Motion to adjourn and seconded. Uh, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed, say aye. We are adjourned.